Welcome to our next discipleship class. So we have been moving along. We had begun to enter into a response to the specific charges against certain alleged biblical contradictions from the atheist.org website. So we have come to the place where their current claim is here um, on the issue of personal injury. So they take these two verses, uh, the first one from Exodus 21, we'll dive right in. Uh, Thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Exodus 21, 35, uh, 23 to 25. And then in the New Testament, Jesus said, this is taken from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. You resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also, Matthew 5.39. So as we move through here, the apparent contradiction uh, is Jesus' contrast to Exodus 21, or at least the apparent contrast. So in response, first of all, under the old covenant of the law of Moses, there were laws given to enable the nation to manage the society in justice and equity. People and property needed protection, as it does in, many soci in any society, so there is no chaos and anarchy. Moses' law functioned as a civil as well as a spiritual document for Israel, so they would understand God's righteousness in their relationship with him, which is spiritual, and with others, which is civil. Therefore, the law, talking about Moses' law now, served multiple purposes. As a matter of fact, uh, Dwight Pentecost, uh, in a um, uh, journal article uh, on the Galaxy website, uh, he did a great um, analysis of the law and the number of purposes. He brought out 10 uh, things that the law served and helped Israel with. Uh, I think it's just... Um, Probably a great read if you have that as a service uh, that you can certainly go through. Now, in summary of that, actually from uh, Pentecost, um, out of his 10 uh, in the list, uh, he gives uh, basically number one is to reveal the holiness of God. Number two, reveal the sinfulness of man. Number three, reveal the standard of holiness required of those in fellowship with God. Number four, to supervise physical, mental, and spiritual development of redeemed Israelites until they should come to maturity in Christ. Uh, number five, to be the unifying principle that made the establishment of the nation possible. Number six, to separate Israel from the nations to become a kingdom of priests. Number seven, to make provision for forgiveness of sins and restoration to fellowship. Number eight, to make provision for a redeemed people to worship by observing the, uh, and participating in the yearly festivals. Number nine, to provide a test whether one was in the kingdom theocracy over which God ruled. And then finally, number 10, to reveal Jesus Christ. So, uh, I think that that's, a, uh, that's an excellent list, certainly, and um, the, the point is, is that the law did a number of things for these Jews. When they came out of Egypt, they were slaves. They didn't know how to be a nation. They had no idea. As a matter of fact, the only ideas they had were probably wrong ones that they had gained in Egypt. So they needed to learn what being a nation was all about under God, um, <clears throat> like Pentecost says uh, they were a theocracy, they were ruled by God. So as we continue here in this response number one, um, in Exodus 21, there are multiple laws on the interaction of people in the society of Israel. Notice verse 23 begins with the word, but. It is the conclusion of the situation explained in the previous verses, 22 and 23. In other words, the criticism starts at 23. 
it says in verses 22 and 23, If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, uh, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges, key point, determine. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life. And then it goes on um, with the verse that's quoted, the verses. In other words, if the baby in the womb dies because of the premature birth caused by the fight, the offender pays with his life, life for life. Because it was considered murder, this is the law of retaliation, the lex talanus, uh, and it was to be as the judges determined, not as individual people. This was not, um, well, this is actually to prevent vigilantes. Uh, the judges of Israel were effectively, um, you know, the town hall where people came to fix their disputes, to get proper judgment. They were to administer the law of Moses in uh, judging over Israel in all the different matters. And this in particular is a civil matter, one person to another, but it's also a legal matter um, if somebody dies. So it's not just civil for uh, the payback of, you know, he stole my animal, so I need to give him an animal and all that. So um, as the judges determine is key here, uh, or the courts, in effect, is what it's really saying. There was an investigation and trial no different than we do today. This provided protection for the unborn child uh, that was a human being and restrained behavior on potential offenders. In other words, the vigilanteism. So this was personal injury law. Uh, this was both a command to punish and a limitation on punishment. The penalty must not exceed the crime. However, according to the Old Testament, authority for punishment was vested in the government, not in the individual. Key point. Now, you have to remember that because we're going to have to deal with what Jesus was teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And this quote here is from the uh, uh, Believer's Bible Commentary by William MacDonald. Uh, excellent resource. I would highly recommend it. Um, so, number two. Now, on the other hand, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5-7, to gave the ethics of the kingdom that was the motivation behind the laws expressed. Now, also, he was helping his disciples to understand in the multitudes. He was not teaching uh, the judges. This was not how you run court. Um, this was how individuals uh, reacted to the laws and what the intention of the laws were. So we go on. It says, The Jews at this point had taken laws meant for judges to exact and were exacting it themselves. In other words, moving towards, um, I'll retaliate for the wrong done against me. In this case, there was a spirit of revenge that fueled the law of retaliation, and this was never the intent of the law in the first place. This is why Jesus addresses the external law of retaliation from the internal heart attitude that would prevent the fight that would cause the injury to begin with. In other words, in our example, from where uh, in Exodus 21, where the quote came from, if people would resist the desire to respond to the insult, smite on the cheek in the first place, obviously, uh, there would be no need to settle a personal injury case. Once again, the context clears up any confusion in the text. So if you really read the context in Exodus 21, um, there's a number of issues that are brought up, but when the judges judged, when they gave their, uh, their judgment as far as um, what the payment was for the crime, it needed to be equitable. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. Um, you know, everything needed to be meted out exactly. In other words, the punishment needed to equal the crime. Um, if, if somebody 
you know, murdered a family member of yours, you know, the, the punishment was not, well, why don't you pay them a little money and then they'll go away. It wasn't like that. Uh, it was life for life. Uh, people didn't have the right to take other people's lives because people are made in God's image. We get that all the way back. That's a moral issue. It goes all the way back to the command when Noah got off the ark in uh, Genesis 9. So <clears throat> though people fight about and uh, talk all around the issue of capital punishment, uh, capital punishment biblically is based on the fact that man is made in God's image and man does not have the right to destroy that just because they want to or for some particular reason. We're not talking about accidents. We're not talking about um, something that happens that, um, you know, could not be prevented or whatever. But um, this is talking about somebody that targets another person to take their life. So I think that this certainly clears up this particular issue in the Old Testament. Uh, the context was entirely different from what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was dealing with the ethics of the kingdom and the hard attitude that was supposed to be a motivation behind the laws. Um, the, the laws, you know, uh, you shall not steal. Well, um, if, if you're at the point where you need that negative aspect of don't take this, don't take that, don't take this because it's, it's illegal, under the law of Moses, then, uh, and it's a sin before God, then you have a problem. In other words, I need to be dealing with other people, um, not having the last gating effect, the fact that I just don't take what they have. That's not really the intention of the law. Yes, the law was designed to prevent you from taking somebody else's property that was not yours. However, the intention of the law was so that you would understand that, A, it's not your property. Number two, you need to trust God with it, what he provides you. Number three, if I'm actually loving my neighbor, which it says in the Old Testament under the law, then if he needs something, I'll help him as opposed to take his stuff. So um, Jesus was dealing with the hard attitude that was supposed to be a motivation to abide by the law not just the law itself, which is why he said, you know, um, you know, they say don't commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've already done it. In other words, uh, if if a person just because a person doesn't actually go out and commit the act of adultery doesn't mean that in their heart, if they're if some guy is lusting after all these girls and everything and he's married, well, he's doing it in his heart. In other words, if there was nothing else to stop him, he would just go do it. If there was nothing to refrain him, he would just go do it. So what Jesus is saying, deal with the heart attitude so that you're not at the place of lusting and then you'll never commit adultery. In other words, you'll never be in that direction. And so, um, you know, later on in a different place, he talked about whatsoever... Um, uh, comes out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, it, you know, he was answering the issue of defilement. The disciples had eaten without washing their hands in the proper ceremonial way. And the, the Pharisees accused them. They said, you know, uh, they're, not, they're not washing before they're eating, meaning ceremonially. And so basically they're unclean. And Jesus said, it, it's not what <clears throat> goes into your mouth that makes you unclean. In other words, um, and again, they had a lot of laws they had built up and, and added to the Old Testament. And so that's what this argument was about. But um, Jesus said, look, you eat something, goes through your system, comes out the other side. That is not what defiles you. What defiles you, he said, is the heart. He said, it, it, whatever comes out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And he goes, what does come out of the heart? He says, adulteries, murders. In other words, he starts going through a violation of all the laws. That's where it starts, in the heart. That's where God does his work so that the actions can be the natural byproduct of that heart attitude. So, well, we've drove that one into the ground, right? The next one is about circumcision. Uh, so the first quote from Genesis 17.10, This is my covenant 
which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man, child, among you shall be circumcised, Genesis 17.10. And then Paul says, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing, Galatians 5.2. So here, the apparent contradiction is between the question of circumcision, why is there a change in the New Testament? Uh, so it's a circumcision issue. You know, the Old Testament under the law says get circumcised. The New Testament says it's not going to do anything for you. Why the difference? Here's the response. In Genesis 17, God tells Abraham that he was to circumcise his genealogical descendants that would eventually make up the nation of Israel and any Gentile proselytes. Because circumcision is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant of promise they were under. Now, the sign of the Mosaic Covenant was the Sabbath day. Um, so we go on. God promised Abraham's descendants the land of Canaan, uh, that through Israel, all the world would be blessed. This is the redemptive blessing of bringing the Savior, Jesus Christ, into the world for all nations. So in the Old Testament, the issue is, God told Abraham, the sign of, of your offspring being under the covenant that I'm making with you is circumcising the males. Very, very simple. All right. So there were two covenants Israel was under in overall. The Abrahamic covenant with those three promises of land, seed, and the redemptive blessing. And then the Mosaic covenant of the law. Um, the Abrahamic covenant was an unconditional, unilateral covenant. God was going to fulfill it. Abraham did not have to do anything in order for God to do it. God promised he was going to use him in that way and fulfill that covenant. The Mosaic covenant was a conditional covenant. They needed to fulfill the law to be blessed. And if they didn't fulfill the law, then they would have the retribution of the law against them. So now... We fast forward to the New Testament. The church is not under the law. Um, the church is a body of believers, Jews and Gentiles together in Christ, and there is no ethnic distinction. So under number two here, it says the Galatian churches were being confused by false teachers who tried to bring these Gentiles who were not part of the nation of Israel under the law of Moses. They reasoned that if Gentiles wanted the Jewish Messiah, the Savior, they needed to be circumcised and come under the law of Moses as proselytes. However, the gospel, the good news, is that faith in Jesus Christ, apart from any law, provides the forgiveness of sins and brings a person into a relationship with God. Not coming under the law of Moses and circumcision. Jesus said, and this is where the new covenant comes in. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26, 28. The Mosaic law that Israel was under was to be replaced with a new covenant in Jesus' blood. We see that in Jeremiah 31, 31. This is the gospel Paul the Apostle preached and how the Galatian churches were established. These false teachers, these Judaizers, tried to take these converts to Christianity and bring them back under the law of Moses uh, and the covenant of circumcision. Reading the verse surrounding, uh, the verses really, surrounding the Galatian verse quoted should easily explain away the confusion. Paul says, I testify to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. And that's the key. In other words, you who are attempting to be redeemed and justified, in other words, have this righteous standing before God in a forgiven state um, and part of the new birth, <clears throat> being born again. He said, um, you're, you're, you who are attempting to be justified basically through Moses' law, uh, he says, 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. This is Galatians uh, 5, 3, now. So, 3, 4, and 6. Um, thus, in other words, concluding, Paul's explanation is that if Christians attempt to be justified in right relationship with God by keeping Moses' law um, uh, through circumcision, they are abandoning Christ. Up to this point, the epistle of the Galatians Paul had demonstrated that Christianity is based on faith in Christ, not getting circumcised and keeping the law of Moses. Chapter 5 begins the application of what he has taught, um, and that is why he makes the statements regarding the law and circumcision. Faith is based on the promise of God. The law is based on obedience to the legal formula given to Israel for their management. Law and faith are mutually exclusive and differing covenants God made with man, Old Testament, New Testament, respectively. Once again, the context clears up the confusion. So the issue here is, is that circumcision is not required today because in the Church of Jesus Christ, Paul goes on to talk about how th there is no ethnic um, or any other distinction um, this is the mystery. This is something that was not prophesied, but revealed in, uh, by the New Testament apostles and prophets that God has, in Christ, put together a body of believers where Jews do not have a priority, but Gentiles and Jews are equal in Jesus Christ. In other words, nobody's got any advantage. Now, obviously, the nation of Israel is an ethnic group. You have people within that nation you have some people that really don't have any faith in God, but they're ethnically Jews. They're genealogically connected to Abraham. In the church, none of that matters. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It doesn't matter, um, you know, any of that. It doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or not circumcised, man, woman, what your your job status is, your, your status in... Um, in society or anything else. None of that matters. Everybody is equal before God. They have the same relationship with God through Jesus Christ because it is based on faith in Christ and being in Christ. That is their position. So uh, this is why uh, sometimes people get confused between the Old and the New Testament if they don't understand the context of both. Uh, we don't just see this with people criticizing the Bible. We see it with Christians, too, at times, because Christians try to read the Old Testament as though it's part of the New Testament and vice versa. Look, for Christians, the entire Bible is written for you, but the entire Bible is not written to you, okay? In other words, the New Testament is specifically written and targeted for Christians, so <clears throat> Paul's epistles and Peter's and John's and everything and the Gospels give Christians, and obviously they give people that are not Christians but are interested, an understanding of what God's intention and direction is for believers in Jesus Christ. If you go back to the Old Testament, though the Old Testament, like Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, Romans 15, the Old Testament um, provides us instruction and it gives us um, principles that are morally correct. Um, it gives us principles that are really, in a sense, uh, legally correct and everything else. Um, so we can read the law as Christians and I can get uh, there are things that are true in the law that are never going to change. But then there are other things within the law. Uh, including the whole law covenant itself that is really just meant for Israel. So we've talked about this before. Um, look, if you violated the Sabbath day, that was a capital crime. However, if you miss church, nobody's going to kill you. So we need to understand there's a different context to these because they're different covenants. And uh, people have a tendency to kind of smash it all together, and that's where the confusion comes in. So, 
Um, we'll move along to our next challenge. Incest. Well, this ought to be interesting. So, um, the verse in Deuteronomy 27 is picked up. Cursed be he that lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. Deuteronomy 27, 22. And then Genesis. If a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, it is a wicked thing. Leviticus 20, 17. <clears throat> and then this note is added in, in the brackets. But what was God's reaction to Abraham, who married his sister, his father's daughter? See Genesis 20. Uh, and then the quote in 17, And God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, thy wife, uh, I bless her and give thee a son also of her. So um, the criticism is pretty evident. The challenge is the law against of incest in Abraham's marriage to Sarah, the daughter of uh, my father, but not the daughter of my mother. So what is the issue? The issue is incest is wrong, and it says it's a violation, yet Abraham married his sister. So how do we respond to that? Number one, under the law, both the Levites, uh, I'm sorry, the Leviticus and Deuteronomy passages, the ones quoted, clearly outline, uh, outlaw incest. I can't talk today. Prior to that, there was allowable marriage such as Cain's, since on, the only family uh, of some sort that were available to marry were people that had to be related to him. In other words, if you start with Adam and Eve and then they start having kids, well, it's got to be one of somehow Cain's uh, family or extended family. Now, obviously, at that point, the, uh, the <clears throat> the entire genetic pool was possessed by Adam and Eve and um, and certainly their immediate descendants and that didn't. Uh, create the problem that we would get obviously with hemophiliacs and everything else but that's we're not really dealing with genetics so much uh, primarily at this issue at this juncture so um, from when critics ask uh, Geisler says number one in response Cain married his sister or possibly a niece the Bible says Adam begot sons and daughters Genesis 5:4. In fact, since Adam lived 930 years, uh, we find out in the next verse, he had plenty of time for plenty of children. Cain could have married one of his many sisters or even a niece if he married after his brothers or sisters had grown daughters. In that case, of course, one of his brothers would have married a sister. So uh, you have to start somewhere. Now, after a while... Um, and this was, you know, you see the development of, of mankind. Um, God gets to a place where he wants to keep families separate um, for a multiple of reasons. So um, now the question is, if Cain married his sister, did he commit incest, which the Bible condemns later under the law of Moses? Geisler again says concerning Cain. First, there were no genetic imperfections at the beginning of the human race, right? Talking about the genetic pool. Um, God created a genetically perfect Adam. Genetic defects resulted from the fall and only occurred gradually over long periods of time. Further, there was no command in Cain's day not to marry a close relative. This command, Leviticus 18, came thousands of years later in Moses' day. Finally, since the human race began with a single pair, Adam and Eve, Cain had no one else to marry except a close family relative, sister or niece. Again, that's from when critics ask. So I think it's, you know, I think it's important to understand that, um, um, starting out 
the human race is going to have a little bit of a different dynamic to it and requirement than once we get further on. So you can't take um, a time very early when there actually is no law against it and then when the law is established go back and say well they violated a law because from a time perspective Abraham was really uh, probably about 600 years um, before Moses gave that law or close to it so um, the, the fact that Abraham had his wife he had his wife and was a pagan prior to even meeting God. So Abraham was called from the Ur of the Chaldees, and he was already married. God took a pagan guy and made the nation of Israel out of him. So violating a law that didn't exist is a little bit silly. The law was established afterwards because God kept not only the tribes separate within Israel, right? You have Abraham his offspring, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had 12 kids. They fathered the 12 tribes. The tribes were separate. The families were distinct within the tribes, and they were separate. They were all separate family units, though God dealt with them as one large family, the nation. Um, but we need to understand that they were all kept separate um, for there's a whole bunch of reasons. There were moral reasons as well as um, genealogical reasons, as well as property reasons. Under the law, uh, property stayed within the family to each generation. Each family needed to be distinct and everything else, So, um, which is really getting beyond the scope of what we're dealing with at this point. If we go on, Abraham was not beyond sin as his lie about Sarah to King Abimelech reveals in Genesis 20. And Abraham did admit that Sarah was the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife, right? Genesis 20. However, even granting this, there is no real proof Abraham violated any law for two reasons. First, the incest laws were not given by Moses until some 500 years after Abraham. So he surely could not be held responsible for laws that had not yet been promulgated. Second, the terms sister and brother are used with great latitude in the Bible, just as the terms father and son. Jesus, for example, was the son, in other words, descendant of David. Sister means a near relative but it does not, as such, indicate the degree of nearness we understand by the word sister, in other words, today. Lot, Abraham's nephew, is called a brother. Likewise, daughter can mean granddaughter or great-granddaughter. They, they actually do not have a term for, like, grandchild uh, in the Old Testament. So, Geisler gives this answer regarding Abraham and Sarah and when critics ask. Moving along, he says, considering the age to which Abraham lived, which is 175, we get that from Genesis 25, it is possible that he married only a granddaughter on his father's side or even a niece or grandniece. In any event, there is no proof that Abraham's marriage to Sarah violated any existing incest law, but if it did, the Bible simply gives us a true record of Abraham's error when God called Sarah Abraham's wife. He was not legitimizing any alleged incest, but merely stating a fact. And I think we need to understand this. When we read the Bible, um, <clears throat> it records things that are wrong but it accurately records them. Inspiration is the accurate recording of them. It is not the validating them as though they were okay. Um, so, I mean, look, Lot later on had an incestuous relationship with his daughters after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The, the Bible did not condone that. As a matter of fact, um, you know, the, the, obviously the way that it's structured and the way that it's presented, uh, even though there was no incest law on the books yet, 
that it was a horrible thing to be done. Um, and it was evident from a lack of faith in God that it was done by his daughters to him. However, um, that's just an accurate recording of it. That doesn't mean that like God was okay with that. There's a lot of things God is not okay with. Um, if you look around the world and you look at what the Bible teaches, you can see that there's a huge conflict and a disparity between what obviously God is looking for in the world and what we see. So uh, just because people have free will to do the wrong thing does not mean that God is putting his stamp of approval on it. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, it's the opposite. So I think we need to understand that before we go forward. If we move on here, it says, It is also important to note that Abraham came from Ur, and Joshua, in his farewell speech, said, quote, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, who was Abraham's father, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. They were pagans. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him through all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. Joshua 24, it's part of his farewell address. Uh, Abraham was a pagan that God used to create Israel. Whether Sarah was his half-sister or more distant relative, it violated no law at that point. So I think, again... That is important, and um, once again, I think the context helps us with that. Uh, before we get into the next one, uh, I know this is a little short. This is only about 37 minutes, but I'm going to end this video. Um, that gives us a few um, areas of Scripture and alleged contradictions if you want to go and dig into them a little more and look them up with some of the verses, and then we'll pick it up. Um, next time on the uh, claim about trusting God. So until next time, may God richly bless you as you continue to study his word.